to um, sometime today or tomorrow. So let's jump in there. Uh, first, I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, today we have Eric Thibault joining us. He's a regional vice president in the Western region. So uh, somebody in the call may get to work with Eric uh, on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, a really nice resource we have here at Global Atlantic, particularly uh, when we're talking about conceptual advanced sales uh, scenarios, uh, really strong in that area. And then we also have Jason Van Zani, who's an AVP in our advanced marketing team. Uh, and he's kind of on the day-to-day the -day side of, of helping agents and advisors, uh, you know, create designs of, of, of multiple scenarios, uh, but premium finance, uh, he's definitely uh, our resident expert uh, in the home office. So two amazing resources we have today to do this presentation. Um, so I want to thank them and the floor is yours, gentlemen. All right. I, I appreciate it, Kyle. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so we're, uh, this is the 101 class. We're going to do a brief overview of, of premium finance. Uh, Eric's going to go and explain uh, some of the reasons uh, why a client would pursue premium financing, reasons such as maintaining uh, liquidity, uh, retaining your capital, uh, perhaps reducing uh, your out-of-pocket outlay uh, for, for life insurance. And then I'm going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts, um, uh, tell you some about our uh, requirements and also go uh, through uh, some commonly used uh, case designs and how the illustrations uh, actually look. So uh, with that, Eric, uh, take it away. Thank you, Jason. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, or afternoon, as it were, depending on where you're calling in from. So let's uh, let's get started. Obviously, this is the, that was the fun the fun slide uh, made by lawyers for lawyers. Okay, so what is free and finance? Simply put, it's not a product. Unfortunately, there's misconceptions in the marketplace that it's a product when indeed it is just a method of payment. Although, in the right scenario with the right client fact pattern. It is a very good alternative for a client. So how does it work? It's really simple as our little graphic shows here. We have a client that's decided that they need insurance coverage for whatever reason it may be, a state tax, uh, maybe supplemental income, or legacy planning, whatever it may be. They've decided they needed life insurance. However, looking at the cost of it and where their other assets are and what they're earning, they think, hmm, Maybe maybe this financing might work because I don't want to liquidate other assets to pay for my life insurance policy. So really simple. The bank makes a loan to the client. In this case, typically it's a trust. Uh, most banks would, would prefer to have some sort of a, a bankruptcy proof entity such as a trust. Uh, there will be collateral that would need to be posted by the client. And we would, of course, issue a life insurance policy. Beneficiaries or name could be you know, anybody in your family, charity, again, vis-a-vis -vis your trust. Uh, we can also lend to LLCs. Uh, we, we don't do the lending, but most lenders will lend to LLCs. Just depends on your favorite lender and what their guidelines are for that. And then as far as collateral goes, I'm sure most of you on the phone are aware, but I'll give uh, a short example. Let's say you have a policy premium of $500,000 and you had cash to earn a value of say 200,000 in year one. Well, that difference between policy premium or, or lending amount of 500,000 to 200,000, that $300,000 gap between cash value and premium would be a collateral requirement. So the banks want to make sure that they are 100% collateralized at all times. You can go ahead and change the slide now, Jason. Okay. So again, why premium financing? I think it really comes down to what am I doing with my other capital, my other assets, or as we like to call it, most people in the industry call it retained capital. And I do know I need it. I need the life insurance. Uh, but I've got a portfolio that, that consists of maybe different types of assets, plus maybe even my business. And my business, it could obviously be my number one asset. And that could be earning a lot of money. Why would I want to take money from other assets that are earning double-digit returns to put into a life insurance policy? And so this is when it becomes appropriate to talk about premium financing again as a method of payment, not a product. 
change. Thank you. So following that theme, we want to help the client maintain control of their assets. You have a lot of business or a lot of clients that are business owners and or property owners, large ranchers, uh, large real estate investment, this, you know, large businesses, small businesses, and they don't have a lot of cash flow laying around. You might have clients that have highly appreciated assets. And if they were to liquidate those assets just to buy their life insurance problem, now we've created a tax issue for them. So that's not necessarily a you know, good piece of advice. Um, qualified funds, the problem with qualified funds is that you've got taxes and or penalties to liquidate. Uh, and then, you know, whatever cash flow you have, let's retain some of that cash flow for other areas in your life, be it investments, living expenses, whatever it may be, and reduce your overall cost by paying interest payments versus the full premium. So let's talk about cost of capital. And cost of capital really is defined as the return on, on an investment versus the cost to borrow your capital. And with today's interest rates, it's real attractive to customers to, to have this discussion and say, because they're doing it in their business. If they own businesses, most businesses have various loans in, in, in their company. They have maybe short-term credit lines, long-term loans, medium-term loans, whatever it may be. They're used to borrowing money. Okay, and They look at well, what does it cost me to borrow money, okay, versus the return on my investment in my business? Maybe my business is returning, say, 18% a year, and if I could borrow at three or four, well, wow, that's 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 positive arbitrage, all right? If I'm bar if I'm earning 18% and I'm borrowing at four, I'm still making 14% net return on investment while still borrowing the money. So. Makes a lot of sense. Um, key thing about premium financing, oftentimes we hear at, at Global Atlantic people talking about agents and advisors talking about the arbitrage that exists between the rate of return on the policy or the assumed rate actually, specifically when talking about an index universal life versus uh, the lender interest rate. That is not the way to look at premium financing. It's never about the difference between what you're borrowing and what you're earning or potentially earning in your policy. Again, it goes back to your cost of capital. What are you earning on your business or your other outside assets versus the cost to borrow the money to pay your premium? Go ahead, Jason. So again, retained capital, you can change the slide, please. Let's talk about retained capital. Here's an example of retained capital. We have a client here that we have an assumed interest rate from the bank of 4%. The annual premium for this client is going to be half a million dollars a year for seven years. Well, this gentleman says to the advisor, you know, I'm making 10% on my outside assets, on whatever those assets may be, on a fairly consistent basis. So if I take $500,000 out of my current portfolio, or it could be out of my business, take $500,000 out of my business, and I've lost that ability to earn that 10% on that 500,000, I have an opportunity cost of $550,000. That's significant to most clients. Versus what if we said, okay, on $500,000, 4% interest would equate just in the first year to $20,000 out of pocket. So the capital that I've retained is actually $528,000. I take my 550, my $500,000 that I saved, I kept it in my business earning 10%. So I earned 50,000 on that. So again, we're at 550,000, right? I pull off 20,000 and in round numbers, I'm at 530. So I got to retain capital, roughly 530, $528,000. And each year you'll see what happens is that instead of three and a half million dollars and then of total premium plus applying a 10% cost of capital, Instead of having a total cost of $5.2 million, okay, I'm I'm looking at significantly less, but I've also retained $4.4 million in my asset base. Call it my business. So when talking to your clients about this discussion of retained capital, it's if you were to write the check for your premium, you lost the ability to earn 
any type of return on that money. And that's what it's going to cost you. All in about $5.2 million versus your interest payments of 20000 40000 and so on and so forth. And this is just a story example. We're not assuming the loan's being paid off anytime soon, just for sake of discussion. And then you can see on the far right again how the retained capital is building. Again, each each line we're subtracting the interest out of your retain uh, out of your opportunity cost. All right, you retain capital and you get this magical number. And it's really not magical; it's just math. So it's an important conversation to have and to understand with your clients. Next uh, page, please. So we've got premium financing guidelines, and I think. Jason, you want to yeah, talk yeah. about some fun stuff? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Uh, very, very good job. <clears throat> um, as Eric explained, uh, premium finance can be a powerful tool. Uh, let your clients retain uh, that capital, control their assets, increase their liquidity. Um, one of the questions that we often get, well, who qualifies for, pre for premium finance? Can, can everybody do it? Well, unfortunately, the question uh, the answer is, is no. Uh, there are some standards uh, set by us, and also the lenders uh, have the minimum uh, net worth and, and income standards as, as well that they want to take a look at uh, for a client to qualify for premium finance. So at Global Atlantic, we really like to see uh, the clients have a net worth of uh, $5 million and a verifiable uh, annual income of $200,000. And the reason for this is because premium finance is not without risk. Uh, there's some uh, variable factors that can take place. Uh, policy crediting can go up or down. The clients may have to post significant collateral. Uh, some things can change. And so we want to make sure that the client has some liquidity, um, has some uh, verifiable income and net worth to be able to make adjustments or maybe even be able to get out of the transaction uh, if they change their mind or, or, or things go bad. So again, $5 million of net worth, uh, $2 million of income, or excuse me, $200,000 of income. If it is a business case, and we do do some business cases with premium financing uh, for executive benefits or key person policies or to finance a, a buy-sell, in those particular cases, if a business is going to own the policy or take out the loan, uh, we want the business to be worth uh, $10 million. Uh, some other, the other things uh, that we uh, kind of look at, uh, some of the additional requirements when you do a premium finance case, is that we're going to want to see two years of tax returns and probably get a, a verified statement from the CP or an attorney that verifies the client's uh, income and, and net worth. So we can verify that they are uh, worth how much that, that they say they are. So uh, again, we're not really asking for a lot of things additionally than what the lender asks. Everybody here has uh, went and, and uh, got a car loan or uh, went and applied for a loan for a house. You had to um, submit pay stubs financials, tax returns, a lot of things like that. Premium finance is, is no different. Uh, you're going to have to supply um, appropriate materials, not only to us, uh, but, the, but the lender uh, as well. And one of the other things that, that we ask is that you be up front with us uh, on, on what you're doing, what lenders uh, you're looking at, um, and uh, what you're doing for a case design, what the client hopes to accomplish with this premium finance arrangement. Um, how much they're paying out of costs or out of pocket. Are they accruing some of the interest? Or are they paying all of the interest out of pocket? Uh, what are they using for an exit strategy? Are they using policy values? Is there some liquidity event in the future that instead of using the policy of values, maybe they uh, are in line to inherit some money or sell their business? And maybe they're using some of those proceeds uh, to be able to pay off the bank loan. So just be upfront with us on 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 what you're doing. It it helps us vet it and, and improve your and improve your case uh, more more rapidly. So what we normally would recommend to expedite your case is there's really two sides um, going on when you submit a premium finance case. There's the life insurance application side. Um, you submit the, the life insurance uh, application and go through the underwriting process like you would uh, on a normal case. Maybe it 
some additional uh, financial verification and documentation required like we talked about. In addition to that, at the same time, uh, there's the uh, loan process with the bank, with the lender. So at the same time you're doing the life insurance application, you're also submitting an application uh, to a uh, premium finance bank uh, that's uh, doing the credit checks, um, confirming the the amounts that you have to be able to post for collateral uh, and that sort of thing. And you should really do those at the same time uh, because um, they both, everybody here that sold a life insurance case uh, knows that life insurance, um, the process can take a while. And some lenders take uh, shorter or longer than others, but the premium finance uh, process with the bank may, may, may take some time as well. So you should really start those um, at the same time. Um, one of the products that we use for, for premium finance, you can, and you can use uh, any of our products, uh, but and, and I don't wanna go too much in depth uh, because we've already done uh, webinars on uh, the global cumul accumulator and got you all fired up about how good a product that is. But some of the features that uh, the global accumulator has uh, make it especially attractive uh, for, for premium finance. Um, obviously, the first one is the smart buy-up strategies. Additional buy-ups uh, that increase your cash value in the policy and premium finance designs, as you'll see, uh, cash is king. So the more cash value that you accumulate in your policy, the less collateral you'll have to post, the easier it is to maybe roll out of the loan, and the more flexibility and the higher uh, death benefit that you can have uh, as well. So obviously those buy-ups uh, play a significant role uh, when, when you're looking at the illustration. But what's nice about our buy-ups is that we typically don't charge for those buy-ups until the sixth or seventh uh, policy year because there's some uh, uh, factors that, that go into to how we actually charge and credit those buy-ups. So uh, as you'll see in the illustrations, the premium finance case designs are really at their most sensitive uh, during their first five or six years. And so the fact that there's not a great big charge, uh, a debit against your cash value, if you will, if you have a, a uh, flat or, or down year in the market, is, is really a good thing. Uh, and, and the lenders uh, that we've talked to really kind of appreciate that design, that there's no big charges or surprises in the first five or six years uh, of the policy. Um, some of the other things that, that make it attractive, and I'll talk about this at, uh, actually have a, a, a case design where we use the early cash value writer, but, but um, the global accumulator has a very good early cash value writer, which for all intents and purposes, uh, guarantees the sum of cumulative premiums paid upon surrender uh, for the first five years of the policy. And then after that, if you still keep the writer on there, it waives surrender charges. So where is that important? Um, like Eric alluded to earlier, all premium finance loans are 100% fully collateralized. So you have to post outside collateral for the difference between the cash surrender value of the policy and the amount of your loan outstanding. Well, if you have the ECV writer or early cash value writer, the uh, guaranteed cash surrender value is 100% of your premiums paid or your loan amount, uh, most typically. So if the premium's $250,000 a year, the year one cash surrender value, if, if you have the early cash value writer, is $250,000. Assuming you're paying all the interest in the on the loan, uh, that enables the, the client perhaps not to have to post outside collateral to, to secure that loan. So uh, very important uh, factor in, in, in premium finance is collateral, and ECV Rider uh, definitely um, helps out with that. In, in fact, about uh, a little bit more than 50% of our premium finance cases at Global Atlantic have that early cash value rider on it. Uh, some of the other things that, that we have, 2% uh, true up. Uh, which is another thing that's kind of uh, unique on our policy and helps out with premium finance. So when it comes time uh, to look at posting collateral, uh, with most, 
the blenders are going to want to see the worst case scenario on the illustration and make, make you post outside collateral for that amount. Well, the way that our policies work is that you actually get uh, 2% upon surrender. It's a guaranteed 2% true up on, on surrender. So the lenders will actually use the values on our illustration at 2% for that collateral number versus other companies where they uh, may only use uh, uh, 0%. So it may not sound like a lot, but on a big case, it can make uh, anywhere between, you know, 50 to a couple hundred thousand dollars difference in the amount of collateral that the client uh, may need uh, to post. Another big thing with the product um, that makes it attractive for premium finance is our 11th month crediting option. So for, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, basically what happens, uh, let's say you bought the policy January 1, very shortly after, at January 1, you send in the premium. Um, most uh, policies, right, don't actually give you an index credit until after the policy anniversary. And what happens when the clients get their first statement, right, everybody that sold an, an IUL or, or sold a uh, index annuity has had this call or conversation with the client. Because the crediting happens after the first policy anniversary, the first their first uh, statement shows a zero percent credit, right? And you get you get those those angry phone calls. But with our uh, contract, we have in the first year an 11th month crediting. So in this particular case, uh, policy is issued January 1. Uh, let's just say our index first uh, crediting date or index date is is the 10th. Uh, that's the date that the index is based on. The crediting date is the 11th. So December 11th. Uh, assuming the market does well, uh, we have a positive uh, gain or index credit, and that credit is going to show up on the first um, the first uh, policy statement. Now, where this comes into play with premium finance is that, uh, and it kind of varies by lender, but typically about uh, 20 to 30 days before the policy anniversary. Uh, the lenders are going to request a low point illustration or a low point letter uh, from from us the carrier, from us the carrier, and it's going to state uh, what the uh, cash surrender, the projected cash surrender value at zero percent is for the next 12 months. So if you had a credit. Uh, let's just say the, the the market did really well and you have a eight, nine, 10. 11% credit uh, to your policy that year. Uh, that means the cash surrender value is higher. That means the client uh, may may be able to post less collateral. So again, uh, very unique design, very helpful option, not only in premium finance, but, but uh, uh, for other sales as well. So I'm gonna show you an illustration, kind of a typical case. Um, we got a guy here by the name of Edward. Uh, rich guy started a rich young guy started a technology firm. Uh, makes about 600 grand a year. Has a net worth of about seven million dollars. Uh, financial planner, insurance agent, has decided he needs 10 million dollars of insurance. They agree upon that amount. Um, doesn't really have um, a lot of current cash flow. Uh, for example, he's doing pretty good with his business. Um, he doesn't want to liquidate assets in his business. To be able to pay large life insurance uh, premiums, so he's decided to take a look at uh, at, at premium finance. So how it's going to work? We're going to buy a $10 million um, IUL global accumulator, and typically in premium finance scenarios, we we design them with an increasing death benefit. And when you see the illustration, you'll you'll know why. It's because we want the uh, net death benefit after we repay back the lender to be approximately the same as what our initial uh, face amount is. So most of these are increasing death benefit and max funded uh, up to or very close to the seven pay or, or, or guideline level premium. So in this particular case, we're gonna max fund this at $412,000 a year. Uh, we're gonna borrow the, the premium from the bank uh, annually, um, and uh, seven times 412 is 2.884 million. 
is the total amount that we're going to borrow from the bank. We're just going to pay the interest on the loan out of pocket uh, each year. And that doesn't get paid to the insurance company. That gets paid to the bank. So how premium finance works is the bank, you get a loan from the bank, and the bank actually sends the premiums to the life insurance uh, company directly. And then you make uh, out-of-pocket premium payments of interest or maybe a little uh, more or less than, than interest. You pay those directly to the bank. So again, the the bank pays the insurance uh, company directly. The client makes interest payments to the bank. And what we're going to do in the illustration, uh, we're going to actually show using later on, uh, I believe in year 15, we're actually going to 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 illustrate using the cash value in the policy. Uh, by taking a policy loan to actually repay the bank. And then after we've repaid the bank, the bank releases the collateral assignment, we own the policy free and clear and have a lot more flexibility in it. So what happens um, when you do a premium finance loan, the uh, lender holds a collateral assignment uh, on the life insurance policy. And this is a very important aspect um, to relay to the clients because there's a collateral assignment on the policy that restricts the client from uh, taking out uh, policy loans, withdrawals, uh, making substantial changes to the policy other than really changing the beneficiary. There's not much that they can change uh, to, to the contract without permission uh, from the lender because the lender wants to make sure that they get paid first, either upon death or surrender of, of the contract. And so the client's gonna have to post additional outside collateral for the difference between the cash surrender value and the amount uh, financed. <clears throat> so in the first year of the illustration, it is, uh, you can see in the illustration that it's $320,000 and that's at the illustrated 6.4%. So what I alluded to earlier, the lender is not going to let the client post collateral based on 6.4% because we don't know, uh, obviously we don't know if the market's gonna allow us to, to have that credited uh, for, that, for that amount, right? Uh, it, it can be uh, more than that, it can be less than that. So the lender is going to make you post collateral on the worst case scenario. And in our illustration, that is at a 2% crediting rate. So at that number in real life, for this particular scenario, the amount of collateral that the client's gonna actually have to post in the first year is $334,000. And then we're assuming a loan interest rate of 3.5% uh, in the first year, and that loan interest rate can, uh, is illustrated to grow by, by 5% in, in year 14. So. A lot of people, that's one of the first things or first questions a lot of agents have. Well, what are the interest rates out there? Uh, what are the terms, the fees, and that sort of thing? Well, it kind of varies by lender, but kind of a rule of thumb is that the interest rates are usually tied to an external index, like the prime rate. The most commonly used uh, index is the LIBOR, which stands for uh, London Interbank Offered Rate Index. And right now, interest rates are historically very, very low. In fact, the one-year LIBOR is, is anywhere from one to one and a quarter percent. And most um, banks uh, charge a spread of uh, either 150 to, to 250 basis points uh, for the loan rate. So right now, uh, you can get loan rates uh, anywhere between you know, two and a half, uh, three and a half percent, you know, depending on the amount that's borrowed and the net worth of the client and their, their terms and, and that sort of thing. So that's one of the reasons why premium finance is really attractive right now is because the, the cost of capital, the cost of borrowing money is extremely low. Uh, and the banks, and you talk to the premium finance lenders uh, out there, even with all uh, the COVID, uh, stuff and everything else going on, they're extremely busy. This is still a, a very good market, 
And one of the reasons is because of the extremely low level of, of interest rates right now. So again, uh, one of the risks in, in premium finance is that those interest rates can fluctuate. Some lenders uh, may have uh, like an extended uh, rate lock. You may be able to get a you know three or five year rate guarantee, but that's not as typical. Uh, most uh, loans are based on a floating rate. <clears throat> Again, that's that's uh, that's tied to um, an index like a LIBOR or a prime rate, something like that. Um, so one of the risks is that interest rates could go up from what you had originally talked to the client about or illustrated. And so what that's going to mean is that, is that that perhaps means more out-of-pocket outlay for the client. And depending on case design, that, that could also mean that the client may have to post uh, collateral. So make sure you have a, a conversation with your client about uh, interest rates. And the lenders uh, do a pretty good job with that. They, they make it known that, that uh, uh, what their interest rate is tied to and, and how it can go up and down as, as well. So again, we talked about collateral, the difference between the amount of finance and the cash surrender value. The lender is gonna make you post um, outside assets to cover that gap. Uh, most commonly things used to post collateral are things like uh, CDs, money market accounts, bonds, the existing, the, uh, the life insurance policy itself. Some people, if they've got other life insurance policies, um, they actually will put a collateral assignment uh, on those as well to help out with the collateral requirements. So you can use a second life insurance policy as, as collateral as well. One of the, the uh, commonly uh, asked questions is can you use uh, real estate uh, for collateral? Almost all of the lenders, that, that is a no. They want to uh, have you post liquid assets, things that can be um, liquidated within 48 hours for collateral. So usually real estate is a no-no, but what you can sometimes do is actually use your uh, real estate in order to procure a uh, letter of credit from another financial institution to, to, uh, to help uh, close that collateral gap. So that's what we commonly see uh, as well. Uh, you can use uh, things like uh, mutual funds, uh, that if you use mutual funds and securities because of their volatile nature, the, uh, the lenders may not give you 100% uh, credit for that for collateral. They may only let you use 50% of the, of the value of, of those uh, securities um, uh, for, for their uh, posting method. Uh, another no-no that you can't use is qualified funds. You can't use qualified funds to, to post this collateral. And you have to be careful about using annuities as well, because when you, there's a collateral assignment on an annuity, it actually loses its, its, uh, its tax deferral. So again, most commonly are CDs, money markets, uh, mutual funds, um, savings accounts, that, that, that type of thing. Jason? So here's how the uh, premium finance Jason? allocation works. Yep. Uh, we had a question. Um, I think there was uh, a confusion between the letter of credit and a run on your credit report. Could you just explain that one more time? Yeah, so a, a letter of, of credit is a guarantee uh, from one financial institution uh, to another. Um, so if you, for example, in this illustration here, you can see that my collateral gap is $320,000. So my premium finance um, loan is with uh, lender A. Uh, I can go to bank B, maybe it's my own uh, personal bank that I have a relationship with, or uh, uh, a another bank, and I can get a letter of credit from that bank and they may charge me 125 basis points. And basically what that letter of credit does is it says Bank B is vouching uh, $320,000 to Bank A. So that's basically what a letter of, of credit is. Um, we don't see it a, a lot, but uh, sometimes we see it in uh, very 
um, high net worth cases or where the person, a lot of their, their net worth is tied up in land or real estate, and uh, they're, they're maybe not as liquid as they would like, uh, but they have good banking relationships, they may get a letter of credit uh, from a bank that they do business with in order to, to help post uh, collateral for the premium uh, finance transaction. So when you're talking about a credit report, I mean, that's something that's, something that's totally different. That's uh, when you apply uh, for the uh, premium finance loan, uh, the bank is, is going to, you know, get a credit report from Experian or, you know, whoever they use uh, uh, for that. Hopefully that. Thanks, Jason. Answer. Yep. So uh, here you can see on the illustration, um, our annual premium, we're borrowing 100% of the money. Our annual premium is 412. We're borrowing 412. Our in initial interest rate is three and a half. Our interest on finance amount is 14,420. Pretty easy math, three and a half percent times 412 is 14,420. That's the amount, the owner's annual outlay, that's the client's out of pocket. That's what they're paying to the bank. You can see the account value, the cash surrender value. So in this particular case, the difference between the cash surrender value and the finance amount, so the 91,922, versus the 412 is 320.078. That's what the client is gonna to have to post an outside collateral. Again, we talked about in real life, that number uh, was gonna be higher because uh, it based on, it, they're gonna want it to be based on 2% versus the 6.5% uh, uh, projection. But this is an estimate. You can see what the client's you know, projected collateral requirements um, are. For example, in year five, um, we're borrowing more money, right? So our, our loan balance is greater. So our uh, interest on finance amount is greater. So our annual outlay is greater. Uh, there you can see in year five, uh, the client's projected to, to have uh, to, to have to post uh, three hundred thousand dollars in in collateral. And the net death benefit is basically the the benefit uh, the death benefit of the policy minus the, the loan balance that we have to repay the lender, right? So at some point in time, the lender wants to get repaid, uh, and that can be either done using debt, using policy values, or using outside funds. So on this particular illustration, in year 15, we're using the policy values. We take a policy loan of 2,884. We're repaying the, the, the bank note, and you can see uh, the, the death benefit dips a little bit because we're taking a big distribution from the policy, but it eventually uh, creeps back up, up and above uh, what our initial face amount was. So to summarize, um, we paid a total of about 1.3 million. We took a policy loan of about 2.8 million in year 15 to pay back the bank. Uh, we maintain the $10 million death benefit or close to it pretty much throughout. To summarize, at age 70, uh, we, we uh, uh, have about $5 million of non-guaranteed cash surrender value and $13 million of death benefit compared to an, an out-of-pocket, total out-of-pocket outlay of, of $1.3 million. That's, that's a pretty good story, right? We, we paid $1.3 we got $5 million of cash and, and $13 million of death benefit. Uh, this, you know, is a perfect example of the power of the arbitrage and, and premium finance. So I talked about uh, the early cash value writer. I just want to go through it real quickly um, on and how it kind of changes the illustration. So essentially the early cash value writer guarantees the sum of cumulative premiums paid for the first five years on the global accumulator. On the um, Lifetime Builder Elite, which is still a very good product, and we do use that quite a bit, uh, the return of premium factors decrease depending on age. For the global accumulator, the factors are 100% for five years for all issue ages. For the Lifetime Builder, uh, you can see, for example, at age 50 in year five, the guaranteed return of premium is only 87.5% of cumulative premiums paid. In year five at age 60, the guarantee is 
of cumulative premiums paid. So the ECV rider isn't quite as robust on the Lifetime Builder Elite as it is on the uh, Global Accumulator, but the rider is is uh, cheaper. It actually has a uh, lesser cost uh, on the Builder Elite uh, than what it does on the Global Accumulator. So trying to show you an example of why you might want to use the early cash value rider. Same scenario as our previous illustration. The main difference is look at the second from the right column, the borrower's equity and policy. That's the collateral requirement. Because we're paying interest, because the guaranteed cash surrender value is the sum of premiums paid, in this particular case, the client would perhaps not need to post outside collateral for the first five years of the policy, right? Um, helps them retain assets. If they don't have the liquidity, it's just one less thing to worry about, having to move collateral around and, and worry about the low points um, er, every year. So that's why about half of the cases that we do have the early cash value rider. A few caveats to the early cash value rider. It's not free. It costs. In this particular case, uh, if you look at the cash surrender value in year uh, 14, without the early cash value rider, it's about, about uh, 4723000 In this case, with the ECV, the cash surrender value in year 14 is uh, 4545000 So depending on age and, and how long you have the rider on there, uh, there is about anywhere between maybe a four to six percent uh, cost to the cash value uh, with the early cash value rider. So there's no such thing as a, as, a, as a free lunch. The other issue if you have the early cash value rider is that there's a commission adjustment uh, the, the, and there's an extended um, chargeback schedule. So it's 100% for the first three years and then a 50% chargeback if the client um, surrenders the policy in years four through five. And the reason for that is obvious, right? The client can surrender the policy and get all their money back. So there has to be some recourse for us, the insurance company, in, in order to um, help help prevent that or recoup our costs. Um, I know we're running short, so I'll, I'll go through this uh, very shortly. One of the other designs that we see is actually using a level outlay. Um, in the previous example, we showed the um, client net out of pocket uh, going up every year as the amount that they borrowed uh, increased. Sometimes it's easier for the clients to get a grasp of if they just do a levelized outlay. So that involves either paying a portion of the premium or paying down the loan at a greater amount than what the interest cost is for the first few years of the policy. What that can do builds equity in the contract, lessens collateral requirements. You may be, you, because you're paying more than the interest, you may, might get a better deal from the lender. So this is kind of the case designed for that. Actually a real case that came in, we, had a, uh, we were in competition. We had a 47-year-old uh, male, $25 million of death benefit. The NLG premium was $180,000 a year. Uh, we crunched some numbers and we came up with a design where the client could could pay $101,000 for 14 years. And here's how it looks. How it looks, you can kind of see the owner's annual outlay there. We're actually paying more than the uh, the interest cost in the first few years, then using policy values to repay the loan. That's a pretty good story, right? Would you would you rather? Uh, pay 101,000 for 14 years, or or pay 180,000 for uh, 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 40 years. Um, so this this was a this was a good case. And there's there's actually uh, a lot of um, um, premium finance experts, uh, old timers, gurus, if if you will, that basically swear by this strategy that that they enforce. Uh, that the client pay usually anywhere between 10 to 15 percent of the premiums um, out, out of pocket. They they swear by this design. So here's our contact information. If you have a question, uh, feel free to give us a call or, or an email. Uh, again, just to kind of um, re-summarize, re right now, 
it's a good time for premium finance because of the low interest rate environments. Maybe some of the things that you need to ask your customers is um, how are you taking advantage of low interest rates, either in your um, personal assets, investing, or, or in your business? Are you refinancing loans? Um, we have a way called premium finance because you either worked hard, inherited well, married well, or got lucky that many people with lower net worths don't have. We have this opportunity with low interest rates to perhaps leverage the low interest rates versus what you're making on your current business or investments and uh, come up with a pretty good um, transaction that, that uh, may allow you to keep control of your assets and, and may even allow you to reduce your out-of-pocket costs for, for your large life insurance premium. So uh, again, it's not for everybody. But my old boss used to say every insurance agent has uh, one big client or one rich relative. So I um, implore you to, to take a look at some of your clients who this who might be a good quali uh, candidate for this and uh, and uh, give us a call and see how we can help. Thanks, Jason. Um, Looks like we may have a little bit of time for some questions. I know that people have been having their questions individually answered. Um, if you have a question that you'd like Jason or Eric to answer, uh, please use the Q&A feature. A uh, couple things before we get to some questions. Um, I got a, uh, a couple more requests. We will send out this recording uh, either later today or early tomorrow. Uh, so you'll get a recording of this as well as the content that, that Eric and Jason went over. So we don't have to individually ask for that. We'll get that out to you. Uh, also, uh, we do have a, another session of Premium Finance 201 uh, that will be happening at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time today, uh, where uh, we'll go a little bit deeper as well as actually have a, a lender uh, available to answer some questions and kind of provide some perspective from you know their end of the transaction and kind of what their responsibilities are how they view uh, the uh, premium finance market so definitely a great end cap to this training that you went through uh, so check that out uh, one question that we had gotten jason and eric when we were going through the retained capital scenario uh, where they're showing the opportunity cost kind of minus um, you know what they were paying in the loan. It looked like there was yeah. a little bit of a gap and there was some confusion there. Can sure. you add why don't we go back to that? that? Yeah, why don't we go back to that slide and I'll, I'll, I'll go a little slower and make sure that everyone understands. Okay, here we go. So again, just as, as a reminder, it's been a few minutes since we talked about this. This client has an assumed annual premium cost of $500,000 a year. And let's just assume also that he would be taking this $500,000 a year out of his or her business. And his business or her business, the client's business, is earning 10% a year on his, his, his cash in his business. Every dollar he invests in his business or keeps in his business he earns 10% a year. So, if we pay premium out of pocket, $500,000, it actually cost him five hundred fifty dollars just staying on the left-hand side of the screen because he would not be able to earn the 10% or $50,000 on that $500,000 that he took out of his business to write a check to an insurance company to pay the premium. So what we're saying is, all right, what if we borrow the money? That way we can keep the 500000 in the business. He can earn $50,000 or 10% on that 5000 But we're also in financing, we're going to have interest costs. And five hundred thousand dollars at an assumed rate of four percent, that interest for that year, year one, just talking about year one, would be twenty thousand dollar cost. You'd have to write a check for twenty thousand dollars. So how do we come up with the five hundred and twenty eight thousand dollars of retained capital? And retained means you've kept. Figure the word I'm retaining 
this money in my business, in my pocket, wherever, okay? So how do we come up with the retained capital? Well, we would take the $500,000 that's in his business, we left in the business, right? We would put, subtract $20,000 from the 500000 to pay the bank their interest. That leaves $480,000. But because that four hundred eighty is staying in the business, he's, remember, earning 10% of his business. So that 500000 actually became $528,000 because he's paid interest. Does that make sense? Maybe we can. Yeah, I think that was, I think that was definitely helpful, Eric. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so it's really, uh, uh, in, in, sum in summary, the, the real issue is, if you're keeping your money in your investments, you're earning some rate on that money. And if you take that money out of your business, you're no longer able to, to earn a return on that money in your business which oftentimes is much higher than the return on an insurance policy. So hopefully that helped. That was very helpful. Um, we had a couple questions and I'm assuming this would be from someone that's never done a premium finance case before, but um, Jason, uh, you know, any tips or, you know, kind of words of wisdom in terms of kind of how you interact with our advanced markets team, you know, what, what can you guys do? Uh, to kind of help, you know, where do they where do they get started? You know, what are some things that they can kind of do? You know, I think there was some um, some fear of kind of doing something detrimental right at the start of it. But if they have a quality prospect, you know, what are some things that Global Atlantic can do to kind of help assist them, kind of with you know from start to finish to kind of make sure that things go smoothly? Uh, yeah, uh, the big thing is uh, communication, and uh, you know, be upfront with us about what your client's looking for. Um, what their insurance needs are, what they're willing to pay out of out of pocket, what their income and net worth uh, is, and uh, I mean, and communicate with us, and you know, uh, we'll we'll help you. Um, don't be afraid to give us a call or email. That's what we're here for to to help. Uh, we can walk you through, uh, help actually prepare those types of illustrations that you've seen there. We can prepare those uh, for you and and send those out that you can uh, share with with the client. And we can also um, introduce you uh, if you have a real case and, and uh, it gets to the point where you think the client wants to move forward. Um, we have some very good working relationships uh, with um, several uh, banks and lenders, and we can actually make an introduction, uh, help make an introduction to a lender to kind of help get that process started. And, and most of the lenders are very, very easy and friendly to work with too. I mean, they're, they're in the service business and um, they're competing. And so uh, they, they want your business and uh, are more than, than uh, happy to help. And, and also a great promotional, a promotional throwout that we're going to have a lender at 3 PM uh, to, to answer some of those questions, right? That is correct. Yep. And, and one more, one more point to the question is, Jason mentioned earlier, it is critical for success and to avoid what I call deal fatigue from the client to make sure that you start the underwriting process at the company, at the carrier, and the bank simultaneously. It's always better to have the bank waiting on the insurance company versus the insurance company waiting on the bank. Because a loan can sometimes, depending on your lender, some lo some lenders out there can take 30 days, 45 days to process a loan. It's just how they work. Some lenders that we work with can, with a full package, have an approval within a week. And it varies anywhere in between. So I, I really would stress that to all of you. Please start your underwriting with the lender that you want to work with at the same time. Eric, it's probably helpful too when they have a case, right? So you are an RVP in the Western region. Um, it's probably helpful as well, not only working with with uh, with Jason, and he'll most likely notify you, uh, you know, from a home office perspective. But you know, getting your RVP, um, you know, the, the the regional contact that you have involved in the case as well too, uh, so he or she can, you know, help guide you and make sure you're using all the resources at Global Atlantic. Is that fair to say as well? That is absolutely fair to say. Please, we've had a lot of great questions out here today. Please reach out to your RVPs as well. Uh, feel free to right after the call. 
Um, and I think you're going to find this very easy to work with, very helpful to work with. One of the questions that came up was, how is this different from Kaizen and NIW? Kaizen is a product um, versus, versus, and that's a that's an intermediary lender. And we have no problem with that at all. Um, what Kaizen really is, is it's for smaller, smaller cases, all right? And the client's going to pay typically 50% of the premium for the first, say, five years. And then um, after that, they're going to borrow 100% of the premium. Uh, however, just, again, be aware that, that with Kaizen, you would still have to meet our income and net worth requirements, and specifically the $5 million worth. A lot of the Kaizen um, cases are not at $5 million of net worth of the client. So that is, that's, that's just a, a design in the marketplace where the client is actually paying half the premium. We're all for the client paying as much premium as they want because the more premium they pay in the policy, the more skin in the game that they have. So um, again, what, what we're, we're showing you, this is just straight up traditional premium financing. That is a program talk, that is specific to smaller cases in the premium financing world. Uh, so there's really no comparison. Um, again, we will work with most any lender out there. All we want, if we haven't worked with them before, all we want to do is see a copy of their collateral assignment and make sure that uh, it fits within our rules. Other than that, we're extremely easy to work with most any bank out there. Great. Well, we are up against the time. I know we have a couple outstanding questions. We will email you directly the answer to those. Uh, but I think, you know, with the questions that were asked live, we got a good variety of, you know, feedback from our attendees and hopefully uh, most of the questions were answered. Again, I implore you, we have a, a 3 p.m. session today where we're going to be going a little bit di deeper into premium finance and, and talk to the, a, a lender that, that's very versed uh, in premium finance. So check that out today. Um, look for that recording and the content uh, either later today or early to tomorrow. Uh, we'll get that out to you so you have a recording and the material that, that Jason and Eric went over. Um, so to end, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, great questions, great interaction. I want to thank Eric and Jason for taking their time. I thought the presentation was excellent. Um, and as always, uh, reach out to us at Global Atlantic. We'd be happy to help you out, answer any questions that you have. Have a great day, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.